What's up, CCV? My name is Carissa, and I'm our kids' worship pastor here. And welcome to Easter weekend. This is no doubt one of the most exciting weekends we have here at CCV, and we're so glad you're here. We love our next generation here at CCV, and if you've ever wondered what we do in a kids' or students' weekend experience, we would love to show you what we got going on. So first up, we're gonna hit up the nursery. Let's go. And we are in our nursery. We love our nursery, and we want you to know that you can bring your little kiddos here, and we have awesome security cleared volunteers who were ready to love and to adore your kiddos. And here's the thing, this allows you to be able to go into worship and fully unplug and know that your kids are safe in this environment. And also, you can bring your kids, whether they're one day old or one year old. We're ready whenever you are. Now, let's go check out Early Kids. Welcome to our Early Kids space. And here, we continue to help kids discover who Jesus is. We have awesome videos, fun games. We've got amazing worship, and we have coaches who are continuously teaching your kids about God's word. We have a blast, so I think you should come check it out. Let's jump on in. All right, guys, we're here right now in our Later Kids experience, and we love having fun here. But this is a space where your kids are gonna continue to understand who Jesus is and take steps to begin to trust him. All right, guys, we are here at our CCV students area, which covers junior high and high school. And this is a space where our students start to really make their faith their very own. We have real, honest, and true conversations about opportunities or even struggles that they face in their daily lives, but also we love to have fun here. I couldn't do much better. Oh, I love coaching for the students. They are the best. They bring so much joy to our week. CCV students, what's your favorite thing? Um, worship. It's time to worship. Let's go! Woo! All right, guys, we're here at our special needs ministry. And man, let me tell you, this ministry has a special spot in our hearts. And we're actually gonna go talk right now with one of our pastors, Laura, and she's gonna share a little bit more about this ministry. All right, guys, we're here with our special needs pastor, Laura Muller. And Laura, would you mind just sharing a little bit more of our heart for our special needs ministry here at CCV? Absolutely. Uh, the special needs ministry is for kids and adults with developmental disabilities. It exists just to share God's great love with them. We have offered the special needs ministry at all of our campuses. We have camp in the summer. We also have Exceptional Stars, which is a sports program for four years old and up. So it's just one way or a couple ways that we just welcome all people to CCV and we're excited to have you here at church. Man, that's awesome. Thank you, Laura. And thank you guys for all that you do. We love our special needs ministries. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you for coming on that tour with us, guys. And hey, CCV camps are coming right around the corner. So be sure to check out the link below and sign up your kids and students for camp. Well, again, happy Easter from us at CCV and we hope you have an awesome rest of your service. Bye guys. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to, to CCV. CCV. Now my name is Randy. I'm one of your online campus pastors and this is our friend Rachel. So welcome in Rachel. Hey, happy to be here. Rachel is one of the pastors at our Peoria campus and she does an amazing job. And we are Thanks, so Randy. thankful to have you with us today. We are truly honored to spend the next hour with you. Wherever you're joining us from, we want you to know that you matter to us. We believe CCV is a wonderful place to discover and grow in your adventure with Jesus. Now, if today is your first time to experience CCV, welcome to the online campus. Welcome. See, here's how we say it. CCV is a community of people experiencing God and building connections to impact the world around us. The online campus is one of the many ways to discover what CCV is all about. It's so cool that you can watch CCV from wherever you are and get a taste of what CCV is like from online. Yeah. From our weekend experience to our small groups and even serving teams, CCV is a place that loves to help people get connected yeah. and grow as much as they can in their faith. Yeah. 
So do this for us. Text NEW to 72020, and one of our pastors will get connected to you and answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, we'd love to help you out. Now today is one of the highlights of the year for us. It's one of my favorites because today is celebrating Easter. Yeah! So we're just gonna take some time to remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So again, welcome to Easter at CCV. And you may be wondering what Easter is. Yeah. So basically, as simply as we can make it, Easter is a celebration of hope and redemption, reminding us that even in our darkest moments, light will always triumph over darkness. And today we celebrate that Jesus has gone to the cross and come out of the grave to serve the people of this world. That's, that's so good. See, Jesus said this in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that you may have life. And the life Jesus is talking about isn't some ordinary mundane existence. Mm -hmm. He's talking about a rich, meaningful life full of passion and purpose to follow him. Today, we hope that you discover the life that Jesus wants for you. At CCV, we welcome all people. We are for you in your best and in your worst moments, through struggle, through pain, but also through your victories. Yep. We want you to know that we're for families, we're for individuals, and for strong, thriving communities that love God and love others well. Yeah. Well, it's about time for our service to begin, so thanks so much for joining us for Easter. We hope you feel welcome and ready for our time together because CCB starts right, right now. now. When you think about God, what do you think about? A powerful and fearsome force or a kind and compassionate father? What if he's both? Both kind and dangerous, wild and refreshing. What if God, like water, is perpetually powerful, pounding coastlines and carving canyons, but also refreshing and life-giving? We get a glimpse of this kind of God in Genesis chapter one, verse two. And the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God's nature, like water, flows from Genesis to Revelation with the power to transform raging seas into springs of life. Untamed, water is death. It's the flood of Noah. It's the, the grave of Jonah. It's the Nile turned to blood and the armies of Pharaoh drowned in the sea. But tamed by God's spirit, water is life. As Richard Rohr reminds us, it is at the bottom where we find grace. For, like water, grace seeks the lowest place, and there it pools up. This is the, the living water that Jesus offered the woman at the well. This is the wine at the wedding in Cana. This is the tumultuous waves that Jesus calmed and then walked upon. This is the promise of God. I will pour water on a thirsty ground and streams on dry land. This is our promise in baptism, that the watery grave will become our resurrection. And in the final chapter of the Bible, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, all who are thirsty, come. All who wish, drink freely from the water of life. This future hope is why we sing right now, oh, praise the one who paid my debt to raise this life up from the dead.
sing it together now. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Hey. This bag of bones. <laughs> and I try with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. Vagabond, come on. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Come on, let's go. He fixed me up, turned me around, he placed my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior. Because he healed my heart and changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I think the master, I think the savior I think God yeah. I cannot deny what I see Got no choice but to believe She's in the wind So, so long to my old friend Burning and bitterness You can just keep on moving No, you ain't welcome here, no From now till I walk the streets of gold I'll sing of how you save my soul This way with sun Jesus now, come on, let's see you sing this thing. But hell lost another one, I am free, yeah, I am free, oh, I am free. Testify, hell lost another one, I am free, tell it, I am free, oh, I am free, come on. Hell lost another one, I am free, I am free, oh.
sound amazing. Thank you so much for singing. You can be seated. Well, I want to welcome you again to CCV, whether you're physically here in the room or you're tuning in online or whatever venue you might find yourself in right now. My name is Travis Brown. And, you know, that song, it captures the essence of what we desire to do, not, not just in this service or this weekend, but every weekend and really what we desire to do as a church. Because what we desire to do is that the name of Jesus, that it would be magnified, that Jesus would be lifted high, that the spotlight would be on him and that he would be worshiped. And one of the ways we do that every single week here at CCV is by remembering what he did for us. But you know, we, we come to a weekend like this where we celebrate Jesus as a risen king and it's, and it's a reminder that you can't get to a resurrection without first experiencing death. And it's that death that we remember every week when we take communion together. See, when we take communion, we take a piece of bread that reminds us of Jesus' body and we take some juice that remind us of his blood and both of those things he sacrificed on the cross for us. And I hope that you had a chance when you walked into whatever room you find yourself in right now, I hope you had a chance to grab one of these communion cups on the way in. If you didn't, no worries. You can grab them. They're at the back of all the rooms that, that you might be in right now. Or if you're joining us online, you can simply grab a cracker or some bread or some juice. But if you're here today and maybe you're new or, or maybe you don't feel comfortable taking communion, I want you to know there's no expectation that you participate in communion. We're just so honored that you would join us on this special Easter weekend. But if you are participating in communion, and let's use this time to magnify the name of Jesus and thank him for what he did through his sacrifice on the cross for every single one of us. Well, the next few moments, we'll have some verses and some prayers on the screen that will help guide our time. But right now, let me pray for us as we get ready to take communion. Father, you know, we come to this weekend and we remember what you did for us. But we're also faced with the reality of what you continually do for us, even today, by giving us hope and life and allowing us to experience forgiveness. And so during this time of communion, Lord, we just give you all our worship, all our focus. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know about you guys, but what held you guys back from following Jesus? I think for me, I didn't know what I was missing out on until I really got connected with like a community in the church and got like just acquainted with things and my eyes just got, became open and it, it really changed my perspective on everything. My past, the burdens of I'm not, why me? Um, you know, why would he accept me? over someone else that's done better than me. Just letting that fear go and just jumping both feet in. I was raised that my mom made sure we kids went to church. The folks didn't go to church, but so we went to church <laughs> until we got out of high school. 
And then when we got out of high school, we kind of dropped out of regular going to church. Once I got married and we decided that we were going to have a church, go to a church that's close to us, bring up our kids that way. And so I got back in and I'm so glad I did because I've been so blessed. How about you, hon? What held me back from Jesus was just temptations and things around me happening, like the conflicts between my biological mother and my stepfather. Like they would fight and all that stuff and I'll get involved and they'll be holding me back. Um, it was just like you. <clears throat> I was one foot in, one foot out at times and then both feet out. Um, just finally took the leap of faith and then jumped right in. Well, when I, when I think about the gospel, um, I always think of salvation and just freedom, freedom from my past, my mistakes, and everything that came before. For me, the gospel is just courage. You have to take that, like I said, just a leap of faith and trust Him and believe in Him and know that He has everything and He's going to take care of everything. Like something to look at and like motivate you and then get you through things when you're in hard times. And for me, it's it's given my life a purpose, but I, I just love it. I love it. It's a free gift that we did, you know, nothing to earn or deserve. You don't have to like prepare yourself to, to approach God. He's always ready and He'll meet you where you're at. Yeah, I, I love those words so much. I love that what you just heard, that Jesus is a free gift that God gave us. It's the story of Easter that you could never earn, you could never deserve that free gift. But some of us have held off accepting that free gift. Some of us have thought about following Jesus, thought about getting baptized. Maybe you've got up to the edge like you heard in that video and you've tipped your toes in the water a little bit. I get that. I was a lifeguard for my teenage years and into my college years. And as a lifeguard, I'd always watch people walk up to the edge of the pool and dip their toe in the water and dip their toe in the water again and dip their toe in the water again. And I'm like, at some point, you got to go all in, right? And I think God has someone here today because Easter is the perfect weekend to finally make a change with your life and go all in with Jesus and get baptized. And this Easter, I want to tell you today and explain to you why Jesus is the only thing that will ever fill up your life and give you what you've always wanted and what you've always been missing. It's Jesus. It's always been Jesus. Uh, I want to do that by just looking at an example today to start off. Uh, how many of you remember um, playing with one of these growing up? Something like this. Anybody just remember playing with these at all? Um, if you didn't get to play with one of these, maybe you were neglected as a child. I don't know, you know, but even if you didn't get to, you, you've seen parents or grandparents, if that's who you are, your kids playing with these or grand, grandkids. This teaches us a very simple lesson in life, and that is that there's shapes or voids that you can only fit the right thing in there, right? So, you know, you get a shape and you know, you're trying to get, oh, right there, that's right. You know, we, we have to figure out which is the right shape into the right void. Have you ever seen a child take a square peg and try to fit it into a round hole? You ever seen that? Like over and over and over and over again, and you're thinking, I hope they outgrow this because this is going to be rough for the rest of their life, right? This picture is actually a very good analogy of our lives. If you think about it, every single one of us was born into this world with holes and voids in our life that we're trying to fill with something. And the question I have for you today is what you're filling your life with, what you're chasing with your life, is it actually filling you up? Or are you left empty, kind of like a square peg going in a round hole? Like is, is what you're filling your life up with, is it truly, if you're honest, giving you happiness and joy and a peace that surpasses your circumstances? And the answer for so many of us today, if we were just honest with ourselves, and remember, you're only as good as you are honest, 
The answer is no. And I want to explain to you what the frustration you feel so often in life is really centered in. And here, here it is. You were born into this world with a God-sized hole or void in your life. In other words, there's a spiritual void in your life that nothing in this world that this world can give you will actually fill you up and bring you what you actually want. And God shows us this void that exists inside of us actually in the very first page of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 1, God creates us. You were not an accident. You were created by God, for God, and for a purpose. And in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our, say it out loud, in our image, in our likeness. Now, this, this, this verse is so rich when you understand it. The word image in the Hebrew is the word replica or representation. Let's go back to our example for a minute. This hole is just a representation. It's a replica. This square, it's a representation or a replica. It's not the real thing. It's just designed to be filled with the real thing. Now, your life, exactly the same. You were created with God's image imprinted on your heart, which means you have a God-sized hole image or representation that can only be filled with God, nothing this world can give you. So if you're chasing something in this world to fill you up, you'll always be left empty. Only God can do that. Now, some of you are thinking, that's easy for you to say, Pastor, because like, you're just filled up with God all the time. Like That's all you do with your job is just like, you know, I'm just filled up with God. Now, I'd be really transparent today and say, I have chased with my life, and still do on occasion, things in this world that I think can fill me up besides God. Uh, if, you, if you've heard Jamie and I tell our life story, and you know, we, we try to be really transparent when, we, when I preach, because it's the only way I know how to preach is just to be real with you. You know, there's times in my life that I have chased everything but God. In fact, when Jamie and I were first married, I, we, we met in Bible college. When I graduated Bible college, I didn't go straight into the ministry. I actually went and worked in the business world for a while at the Intel Corporation. And both Jamie and I worked there, and we were making loads of money. We both got to the place where we were making six-figure salaries with bonuses and stock options. And I thought to myself, we've made it. We will have happiness now like you couldn't even imagine. Because I grew up in a household where there were four of us kids. My dad was a teacher. That was the only income for the longest time. And we didn't have a whole lot. And my parents' marriage really struggled. And I thought the reason they struggled is because they didn't have enough stuff. They didn't have enough money, and so we were making so much money, I thought we are going to be so happy. And if you've heard us tell our life story, man, we consumed like gold medal athletes. I mean, we just cons- we bought the houses, the cars, the vacations, and we consumed and consumed and consumed, and one day we woke up empty, realizing that there's nothing you can consume in this world that can actually fill your heart the way you were designed to be filled truly when you're seeking after God. Jim Carrey put it this way. I like this, the actor. He said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. I like that. Jesus put it more pointedly in Matthew chapter 16. He said this, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Notice what Jesus is saying, that there's a world you can chase and try to gain but your soul will be forfeited and you'll be left empty because only I can fill that. Let me, let me put it in this language if this, if this helps you. I would say it this way, and this is kind of the big idea for Easter, all right? The big idea for Easter is this. You can't fill a spiritual void with an earthly thing. Can I say that again for, to sink in for somebody? If you have a spiritual void in your life, which you do, created in God's image, that only God can fill, You can't fill a spiritual void in your life with an earthly thing, something this world can give you. It will always leave you on empty. And I think in our lives, there's about four main things that we chase in this world to fill us up that only God can. I call it the four mores we think are gonna lead to happiness. It's more success, more stuff, more sex or pleasure, however you wanna describe what brings you pleasure, or the sneaky one is more of our own self-righteousness. 
Now, Jamie and I chased those first couple like crazy in our lives at certain times. More success, more stuff. And maybe that's where you find yourself. You just think if I just get more money and get the bigger promotion and get the better house, we'll finally have everything we've always wanted. Some of you, though, are chasing that third one. You're chasing a relationship. You're chasing a marriage. Some of you think this. If I could just be married, I would finally feel complete in life. Well, let me ask the married people here, or at least if you've been married over three weeks, all right? Um, <laughs> Anybody say about your spouse that they meet every single need and desire and they complete you in every single way in your life? If you do, you're lying, all right? (laughs) I love marriage. I'm the biggest pro-marriage guy. My marriage is awesome. But if you put on your spouse the weight that they have to complete you and meet every need you have and desire in your life, you're putting on them a burden that they were not meant to bear. And that might be why your marriage is struggling. Only God can truly fill the deepest parts of your life, not a relationship you're seeking. And that's why some of you, you know, maybe you've even given up on marriage or you've given up on dating because it just hasn't worked in your life. And so now you have no guardrails at all when it comes to sex or relationships. You just go from one relationship, one one night stand to the next, to the next, to the next. And what you know is you wake up empty all the time. Because you are chasing something that is not going to fill you, especially when it's not got done on God's terms, but it's done on yours. And so at some point, you get to a point where you say, hey, if this isn't filling me up, I feel shame, I feel emptiness, and then we start to medicate to try to deal with that. We turn to a pill or a substance or maybe a bottle. And listen, you, you can numb the pain for a little bit. But some of you have been there, you know you wake up the next morning and the emptiness is still there. This is why no amount of pleasure seeking in this world can ever truly fill you up without God, especially God at the center of a relationship and a marriage. But the sneaky one to me is not just sex or stuff or, you know, more, more pleasure. The one that I think I see as a pastor keep more people from God or giving their life to Jesus more than anything else, the sneaky one is our own self-righteousness. And, and I see this play out in two extremes. One is I see people say to me, well, I, I'm just not good enough yet to give my life to Jesus. I, I need to clean my life up and get things in order, and then I think God would accept me. On the other extreme are people that say, well, I don't really need God or, or Jesus because I'm a good person already. I'm a loving person, and good people go to heaven, so I'm good, right? And the thing I think you have to wrestle with if you think good people go to heaven is how good is good enough. In fact, I I give you an exercise to do that's just helpful sometimes, just thinking about your own self-righteousness apart from needing Jesus to forgive you would be if you looked at a scale and just think about a scale from zero to 100, zero would be the, the worst person on earth. Okay, this is reserved for like Hitler and axe murderers and you know, somewhere on the bottom scale here is probably cat lovers. I can't prove it, but I, I think it could be, you know, <laughs> cat lovers. You know, it's, if you come to CCV, you know it's all in fun. Just relax, all right? I just struggle that God would see cats above 50%. That's all I'm saying, okay? <laughs> but, but, you know, that's zero. Um, all the way on this spectrum is, is 100. This is perfection. God, Jesus, his son, without ever doing anything wrong. Now, if you had to pick a number on this scale to represent how good you are, what number would you give yourself? I want you to pick a number in your mind right now. On the count of three, I want you to shout it out loud. You ready? One, two, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, are you serious he's going to do that? I would have just got some of you marriages, you'd been in a fight the the whole way home. You'd be like, are you kidding me you gave that number? You're not even close to that number, right? Let me, let me help you out for a second, okay? You're not a zero. You're not even close to 100. This is, God is perfect. We are not. In fact, all of us have told a lie. Um, All of us have done something wrong morally or sexually or financially. We've, We've blown up on our family. In fact, some of us on our way to church today blew up on our family in the car, and you know who you are, right? You were driving in your car, and you said, your kids were acting up, and you said, you shut up! All of you, shut up! We're going to church to worship Jesus, okay? 
and you're like, when you get out of this car, you smile like you love Jesus. Go! You know, and your kids are like, Dad, you know. We're laughing because we've been there. I've been there before, right, okay? So, you know, all of us, you're not 100, you're not a zero, but what number would you give yourself? Now, I don't ask you to do things I won't do myself, so I, I, I tried to go through this exercise, and in the past I've done it, and I, I asked Jamie, Jamie, what number would you give me? And she gave me a 99. <laughs> you know that's not true, right? <laughs> actually, um, some people meet Jamie sometimes, and they'll actually say this, so like, is it so awesome being married to Ashley? And she's thinking in her mind, you have no idea, <laughs> right? Because I, I, I'm sinful, we all are. In fact, when, when Jamie gave me my number, I asked her what number I'd be. Um, I won't give you the exact number, but let's just say I, I just barely made it past 50%, all right? I'm a pastor, and I, I'll keep it real. I've got my own stuff that I deal with. We all do. What number would you give yourself? The reason I like this exercise is because it forces you to do two things. One, it proves to every single one of us that God has a standard and we don't meet it. None of us are perfect. And the second question it makes you wrestle with is, okay, we don't meet the standard, then how good is good enough? And you have to answer that for yourself. Like, what do you, what do you think? Do you think if, if you make it in the 90th percentile, is that good enough? Well, that's not, that's not hardly anybody, by the way. Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe like C is passing, right? That's 70%. I mean, this is like, this is kind of good, right? Some of you are like, no, D's get degrees, bro. Come on, I mean, this is what we do, right? <laughs> D's get degrees. I don't know, maybe, maybe God grades on a curve, and as long as you're better than most people around you, which makes you hyper-judgmental, by the way, awesome, you know, then maybe you're good. I don't know, maybe it's like politics. If you just get past 50%, if you're 51% good, good deeds, compared to 49% bad deeds, God's like, way to go, man, you're in. Could you imagine, though, how, how much... You would live life with no peace with this idea, trying to figure out how good you have to be to get in, to be made right with God. I mean, let's, let's say it was 50%, and your whole life you were hovering on 50-50. And the last day of your life, you blew up on your family. And you dropped to 48%. Do you go up to heaven and get to the pearly gates, and God's like, sucks to be you, man. You were right there, and you ruined it. He pulls the lever, down to the bad place. You know? I mean... How good is good enough? The answer is every single one of us, myself included, has a gap that we cannot fill with a perfect God. We all stand level at the foot of the cross, no matter how good you think you are, none of it's good enough. The only answer is Jesus filling the gaps with our imperfection and sin before a holy and righteous God. And that's why I love Easter. Because Easter is the best picture of why God had to send Jesus to this earth to die and rise from the grave to conquer sin and give us peace with God, being reconciled and forgiven inside of God. And Jesus is the best picture of what God wants to do to come fill your life and fill that void that you fill. And so what I wanna do is I just wanna explain to you in the simplest terms possible why Jesus came and why you need Jesus in your life and why you need to give your life to Jesus. It's called the gospel message of the good news. And I like to explain it in very simple terms because I think we overcomplicate the gospel. I wanna explain it in A, B, C language. Why, why do we need Jesus? It's A, B, and C. A is this. A is you have to admit you have a problem. At any recovery program, the very first step is you have to admit you have a problem. And if you thought good people go to heaven, it's time for you today to go, wow, I have a massive problem. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. And forgiven people can only be forgiven by the blood of Jesus. That's it. So I have a problem. I have a problem. And, and Scripture tells us our problem so clearly in Romans 3.23. Listen to what it says. It says, for everyone has sinned. That's me, that's you. And all of us fall short of God's glorious standard. God's standard is perfection. God is perfect, and only perfect people get to spend eternity with God in heaven. That makes all of us hosed, me included. 
We have a problem. Even if you think you're the best person in the world, you think you're 99. Let me tell you what scripture says in, in the book of James. It says this. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as the person who's broken all of God's laws. The moment sin entered your life, which is all of us, we are in the same position before a holy and righteous God. You have a problem, I have a problem. That's A. B is, now you gotta believe that Jesus is your only answer. There is only one person in human history that has lived on this earth, lived a perfect life, died on a cross, shed his blood for you and for me, and rose from the grave three days later to conquer sin, forgive you, and conquer death forever. That's Jesus. No one else can claim to do that. No other religion, no other person. God sent Jesus as our answer. And some of us struggle. We think, well, how did Jesus rise from the dead three days later? It's kind of like uh, years ago, the magician David Copperfield was doing a show in, in Vegas to a sold out crowd, and he did an illusion that no one understood. And so this lady uh, you know, blurted out from the balcony, David, how'd you do it? Tell us. And he said, ma'am, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. And she immediately said, then will you tell my husband? <laughs> so it's like, hey, how did Jesus rise from the grave after being dead three days? I don't know, but it's undeniable. History proves it, and the eyewitnesses we have in Scripture, over 500 prove it. And I don't know how he did it, but if God created everything, everything in this world around us and created us, I'm confident God has the power to raise dead things back to life. In fact, you've seen it. Many of you have seen people that were dead emotionally, dead spiritually. They had a dead marriage. They had a life where they were thinking about ending their life and they gave their life to Jesus and you saw a change in them that you can't explain. And what you saw is Jesus bringing dead things back to life. It's what he does. That's what he does. It's who Jesus is. That's why we have to rely on Jesus, not our own righteousness, to be made right with God. In fact, if I took you back to the scale and you look at the scale of zero to 100, remember, all of us have a gap. And I want you to visualize this gap. This is my favorite picture of what the gap looks like. We have a gap because of our sin between us and a holy and righteous God. And when I say you, I mean me. All of us have a gap between us and God that we cannot fill, and I don't care how good you think you are, how many good things you do in life, how many people you help, how many nonprofits you serve in. The gap exists forever because of our sin. And so what did God do? What is his answer to that gap to reconcile us back to us because he loves us so much? He sent his only son, Jesus, to bridge the gap between us and God. That's the message of Jesus. That's the message of Easter. That's why we celebrate Jesus coming back from the grave. This is the picture. And in hey, until you, until you rely on Jesus and invite him into your life, you'll have that spiritual void which is being distanced from God and you'll feel it forever. And that's why God sent Jesus. It's the most famous verse in, in scripture. John 3.16 right? What's John 3, 16 say? You could repeat it, even if you're not a Bible person. For God so loved the world, and you need to insert your name right there. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. And some of you are thinking, well, oh, that's awesome. So I just got to admit I have a problem. I just got to believe in Jesus, right? Believe what he did? Well, in scripture, in the book of James, it actually says in the book of James, that Satan and the demons believe in Jesus, and what good did that do them? No, we, we have to take our belief and move into a commitment to Jesus, commit our lives to Jesus, and that's the C. Not only admit you have a problem, believe Jesus is the answer, but C is you have to commit your life to Jesus by repenting and being baptized. Now, repentance is just a word that means to make a U-turn. It means that at one point in your life, you were living for yourself going your way, your direction. And you have to have a moment in time where you just say, I'm gonna make a U-turn and I'm gonna to turn to God. I'm gonna follow him. He becomes my Lord and King. I'm gonna follow him, not, not myself. That's what repentance is. And baptism is you publicly showing God and others your outward commitment of an inward change. 
Like, uh, baptism's the most beautiful picture of Easter you can have. It's the perfect picture. Because baptism, we go underneath the water, which, sep- which represents Jesus' death, and us dying to ourselves. And when we come out of the water, that represents Jesus' resurrection, and us raised to life to be a brand new person because you're forgiven and God comes to live inside you now. That's the picture of baptism. It's awesome. And the question you have to ask is, man, am I in my life, filling my life with the forgiveness and hope and peace that Jesus can give me, or am I filling my life with everything this world can give me, and I'm left on empty? 1 Peter 3 says this, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from your body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards, conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection power can save you, not your own righteousness. And that's why when you read through the New Testament, almost every single time someone decides to believe and commit their life to Jesus, watch what they do. In fact, the very first message ever preached about Jesus when he rose from the grave was from Peter in Acts chapter two. This is the very first message ever preached about Jesus. And listen to what it says, Acts chapter two, verse 38. The people were cut to the heart and said, Peter, what do we do? We want to give our lives to Jesus. And here's what Peter said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Very simple question for you. At what point in your life did you give your life to Jesus, repent, and be baptized? If you've never done that, What are you waiting on? Because you will never have peace and happiness and joy in your life until you fill that spiritual void, which is the biggest void you'll ever have in life. And I don't want you to miss the the, the tail end of this verse, because when Peter said repent and be baptized, what did he say is the result that we get when we repent and we're baptized? Look, Look at the very end of the verse. And you will receive the gift of what? Say it out loud. The Holy Spirit. Remember that spiritual hole you have in your life? When you give your life to Jesus, his spirit comes inside of you and fills your life in a way that you can't describe or explain. And his spirit now gives you direction to have the marriage you've always wanted, the relationships you want, the direction you want in life. It's God's spirit that fills you up. Why? Because it's a spiritual void, not a physical one. And everything in this world that you chase can't fill that void the way God can. C.S. Lewis has one of my favorite quotes of all time. He says, if we find ourselves with the desire that nothing in the world, this world, can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. If you find in yourself everything you're chasing in this world doesn't satisfy, the most probable explanation is there's something outside this world that can fill you up, and that's God. And his son Jesus coming into your life to forgive you, give you hope and peace and forgiveness like you've never experienced before. Let me say it again. You can't fill a spiritual void with an earthly thing. So at what point are you gonna stop chasing the things of this world and start chasing after Jesus? You know, maybe one of the best examples in our modern time of someone that chased everything this world had to offer and came up empty and finally gave their life to Jesus and testifies that it's the only thing that filled him up is actually Deion Sanders. You guys know who Deion Sanders is? If you don't, he's the coach. He's called Coach Prime now. He coaches the University of Colorado, pretty famous guy. But in his previous life, he was one of the only people ever to actually play two professional sports. He played baseball and professional football. And he was a stud, made tons of money, had everything. And in his book, Chasing the Wind, he talks about trying to fill his life with everything the world has to offer, and then finally turning his life over to Jesus. And he writes this. Let me just read it for you. He says, quote, I had just had the best season of my career. Everything I touched turned to gold. But inside, I was broken and totally defeated. I remember sitting at the back of the practice field one afternoon away from everybody and tears were running down my face. I was saying to myself, this is so meaningless. I'm so unhappy. I tried everything, parties, women, buying expensive jewelry and gadgets, and nothing helped. I had everything that power, money, and sex could give me, but it wasn't enough. I had no peace, 
no joy, and all I had was emptiness inside. Success almost ruined my life, but thank God I came to him in just the nick of time, and that has made all the difference in my life. And listen to what he says next. If you are not satisfied with what the world has to offer, you too can invite God to come into your life. End quote. And that's the opportunity I want to give you this Easter. To say, this world can't fill me up. God, only you can. I want to give you a chance to turn your life over to Jesus today to repent and be baptized. There is no better weekend than Easter to do that because it's the perfect picture of baptism. What Jesus did for you on a cross. Rising from the grave three days later, and you may come today and say, well, I, didn't, I, think I wasn't prepared to get baptized today. You may not have been prepared, but I think Jesus circled this date on his calendar for you. And you may say, I didn't come prepared, but we came prepared for you. At, at, our, at our baptistries on every single campus, we have a change of clothes. We have shorts in all sizes. We have a shirt that says change because that's exactly what happens to your life when you give your life to Jesus. We have towels. We've tried to make it as easy as we can on you, but you still have to make a decision. It's been said that you can be a thousand steps away from Jesus and he took 999 of them and you have to take one. You just have to say yes. It's a free gift. You don't earn it or deserve deserve it. I know some of you have your excuses and some of you, here's your excuse. Well, I just gotta get, my, my life is a little messy right now. I need to wait until I get cleaned up. Wrong. The best time to give your life to Jesus is when it's at its messiest. Because he, he takes you as you are and then his spirit comes inside of you and helps you get your life in order. You can't get your life in order without Jesus. Why, you, why would you try? Some of you are like, well, I messed up too bad. No, you haven't. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all come as sinners and Jesus can wipe away any of your past. Some of you are like, well, man, I mean, I'm a little embarrassed to go out there. I mean, people think I'm a sinner. Uh, yeah, we're all sinners. And listen, if you don't stand up for Jesus, how is he supposed to stand up for you? No more excuses. Some of you are like, well, I got baptized as a baby. I mean, t- should I do it again? In scripture, the only example we have is people being baptized when they knew what they were doing. Jesus was baptized himself as an adult, so we just follow the example of Jesus. And I'll just give you my life story. Um, I was baptized as a really young child, had no clue what I was doing. I really only did it because my parents were baptizing my older brother, and I just kind of wanted to get wet. I I didn't know what I was doing. And later on, I realized it, and I was baptized a second time. And it's completely appropriate, by the way. If you don't have any recollection, don't remember, or you you didn't make the decision for yourself, it needs to be your decision. And if you knew my past life, you might say, you needed to get baptized twice, buddy. I mean, good job. Some of you have some silly excuses, though. Here's some of your silly excuses. Well, I, I'm, I'm all dressed up for Easter. My hair and makeup's perfect. I mean, ooh. Hey, if Jesus hung on a cross half naked, shamed by people around him, maybe you can mess up your hair and makeup one day for him. Amen? Come on. Hey, what, what about this? Some of you are afraid of the water. Like, you're just like, what if they drop me in the baptistry? Listen, we've been doing baptisms for a while. We've never put someone under the water that we haven't resurrected out of it, Okay. <laughs> And hey, maybe your love of Jesus can overcome your fear of the water or your fear of being embarrassed. Jesus had every excuse not to die for you. Maybe it's time you die to every excuse you've had. Some of you are like, man, I came with friends. I don't want to inconvenience them and we were supposed to do something afterwards. I don't want them to have to wait. Listen, I promise you the people you came with, you're not inconveniencing them at all. They'd love to celebrate with you. But if someone had to leave and you were left without a car, here's our commitment to you. We'll get an Uber for you. That's how important it is for you to make a decision today. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You have today. And today's the day. Many of you need to give your life to Jesus. No more excuses. And I want to give you a chance to just make a decision. So I'm going to invite our bands and all of our campuses to come. We're going to listen to one last song. I don't want you to stand. I want you to stay seated. I just want you to listen to this song about Jesus. And during this song, I just want you to answer this question. God, what are you telling me to do? And whatever it is, you just be obedient to Jesus and you watch him fill every void in your life. 
And if you're a follower of Jesus here today, listen, what a great reminder we've had today of what Jesus did for us. And you might pray for the people around you that need Jesus. And together, let's listen to this song about all of us need Jesus. Oh, I've heard that you can move the mountains. How I need this mountain moved. Would you come and find me in the valley? Could you make a way for me? I've heard that you can heal the broken, but these wounds are buried deep. Would you come and be the great physician? Could you do a work in me? Jesus, I need you like nothing else, nothing else. Jesus, only you and nothing else, nothing else. And I've heard. Can walk on water, and my mind's a raging sea. Would you come and calm the storm within me? Could you walk the waves with me? Jesus. I need you like nothing else, nothing else, Jesus, only you and nothing else, nothing else, Jesus, I need What's God speaking into your life right now? I'm just telling you, whatever it is, just be obedient and say yes. It's amazing grace. We just sang about it because it's free. You, you don't ever do anything to deserve it. You don't earn it. You just accept the free gift of Jesus that God gave for you to come fill every bit of your heart and your life and your relationships and every part that you're missing. And if you need to get baptized today, you don't walk to your car at the end of the service, you walk straight to the baptistry. 
We have people there ready to help you, change your clothes, we're ready. And you know, people sometimes get confused about what baptism looks like. So we thought, let's just do a baptism on stage right now to show you what it looks like, all right? That's what we're gonna do. And listen, th this isn't staged. This is a real person that decided they wanna get baptized on Easter. They just agreed to be able to do it for you. And so, uh, pastor, on our staff, his name is James, is gonna do the baptism. He's baptizing Judy. And uh, when Judy gets baptized, I want us to throw a celebration just like they're celebrating heaven when someone gives their life to Jesus. So let's, uh, let's join them right now. Well, Judy, you have been coming to CCV for almost 20 years. Your husband, Steve, is backstage. And first off, we just wanna say thank you for inviting us into your baptism, an outward expression of an inward emotion. Millions of other Christians before you, they've made a profession of faith, publicly declaring Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And I wanted to extend that to you in the form of three questions. I'm gonna ask them all at once. All you have to do at the very end is just say yes. So here we go. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of the living God? Will you receive him today as your Lord and your Savior? And we commit to following him, being changed by him, and fulfilling the mission of Jesus to the best of your ability. Yes. Amen. And by your profession of faith, we will baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what a changed life looks like. When, when you see someone come out of the water, I hope that never gets old for you because that's God changing lives. And if you need that, listen, don't you dare put off tomorrow a decision you can make today for Jesus. You go to the baptistry right now, we're gonna celebrate with you. There's no better weekend to do that than Easter. And I wanna pray right now for anyone that just needs to make that decision. Would you, would you pray with me? God, today all of us have been reminded what you did through Jesus, that you sent your only son to live a perfect life so that he could die and with his shed blood cover our sin so that we could be made right in your eyes and forgiven of all of our sin. And thank you for him conquering death so we can have a life here on earth that's lived for you, but then a life eternity, for eternity live with you as well. And so for anyone here that needs to make that decision to follow Jesus, I pray you give them the boldness and courage to just say yes today, to walk to the baptistry and watch you change their life. God, we pray all this in the powerful name of Jesus. And we all said, amen. Happy Easter, everybody. Have a great We'll see you next week. Again, thanks so much for joining us today. We hope Easter celebration reminds you of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. See, Jesus truly wants us to know that he has gone to the cross and came out of the grave so that you may have life. Mm -hmm. Please know this too, our church is here for you. We believe in you and we are ready to resource your adventure with Jesus, whatever that looks like. And to be honest, we all grow best when we have people in our life that help us grow in our yep. faith. So let us help you get connected. You can text CCV to 72020 and one of our team will reach out and answer any questions you might have. We hope today's service was impactful as you look to move forward in your faith. Next week, we start a brand new series focused on listening to God's voice in the midst of a loud and chaotic world. You don't want to miss it. So do this for us. Invite someone to join you, maybe a family member or a friend or a coworker. Come join us at the online campus. 
Have an awesome week, guys. We'll see you right here next weekend. Bye. See you guys.